This is not a moral obligation such as, as um, you know, we have a sense of all. It's not a moral obligation. Therefore, we all, we have a moral obligation to take heed. No, 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 no. This is not a moral obligation. This is a logical necessity. Because God created, because God spoke, because Christ is higher than, because Christ is better than, therefore we all, a logical necessity, not a suggestion, the same word as must in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, and in Acts 9, 6, when Saul asked the Lord what he wanted him to do. And so because Christ has delivered this message, we ought to give the more earnest heed, to give heed. Russ has got an airplane. I tell Russ, Russ, hey, we're going to take off out here. Okay, you see why. We're going to get it out to you about 3,000 feet. And then I want you to fly a heading of 180. It's time for Russ's buying a flight review. Make sure he's safe. So we're flying a heading of 180. Next thing you know, Russ and I, we're talking. We're, man, this is nice. We've got the avionics and this and that. Look at this. A lot of bells and whistles. And I'm over there, you know, playing with the GPS. And Russ is nervous. And I'm you know, pushing buttons and all that. Next thing you know, get, why don't we just go over to Lambert's? You know, we can have lunch and we talk about flying into Lambert's a little while. And I look up and, and Russ is distracted. And we're flying a heading of 190. But this is his check ride. I, this isn't a time for teaching. But I give him a, 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 I say, Russ, take heed to your heading. And Russ looks at it, goes on, and continues flying 190. Is that what that word take heed means? If we're flying slow, and we get down to about 50 knots for us, and the stall horn goes off, and I say, Russ, take heed to that stall warning. And Russ says, okay and doesn't take any action, what's going to happen? We're going to get in a spin and maybe <clears throat> Russ can get it out of us, get it, get it, get us out of it. If he'll kick the other pedal, <laughs> put that nose down. Nose is already down, but maybe he can get us out of it. But that word, take heed, we would think, so, we would think that Russ has lost his mind. If I said, take heed to that stall warning, and he didn't change anything. The word take heed doesn't mean, let me just put a check by that. I've noticed it. I've received, check Stephen, I've received the information that the stall horn is going off. That's not what that means. Okay, I've taken heed. The word literally, it's a nautical term. And it means to hold a ship in a certain direction. To sail towards. To give heed. It means to hold on to one's course toward a place. And so if I tell Russ we're going to take off and I want you to give heed to heading 180. His reply is, or if Tower tells you, take heed to heading 180, his reply is what? Wilco. Period. What does Wilco mean, Russ? We'll comply. We'll comply. We'll comply. Take heed to heading 180. God said, you take heed the things that you have heard. What's our reply? We'll come. We'll comply. We'll comply. Give a more earnest heed 
to that which is spoken. Uh, a more we we can give heed to lots of things. And Russ can give heed to one eight zero. Uh, the other day, I saw something that was interesting in the, the Messenger newspaper, and I I bought a paper, and I you know kind of read it. Do we read the Bible differently than we read other things? Curtis Cates. In his class, Christian Evidences, we had to read a book uh, called The Genesis Flood by Geisler and Dix. It was awful, terrible reading. And just, just unbelievably, just for me, it was, it was, uh, Torturous. We had to read it. We had to read the footnotes. He had questions on the test about what was in the footnotes. Just crazy stuff like that. But one of the questions on the exam, if I'm not mistaken, I think was the last question, or last couple of questions, was what percentage of the book, The Genesis Flood, did you read as a requirement in this class? 100%, 75%, 50%, 25%, words like that. So you circle, you circle, circle the portion amount of the book that you read. And the second question was something like this. I read the Genesis flood, A, slowly and deliberately, B, like a newspaper, C, you know, absent-minded, or D, you know, without much thought or whatever. Words like that. <clears throat> the Hebrews writer is telling us that not only should we give heed, but we should give the more earnest heed. We should read this differently than you read the National Enquirer, Rebecca. We should read this differently than we read, you know, Women's World, Beth. Yeah. Southern Living, Karen. We read it differently. We give the more, we give, we give heed differently to the things that we have, to the things that we have heard. Because it's possible for people to be indifferent to the words of Christ. It's possible for those who have run the course, who have been on 180, to start flying 190 and 090, and to fly a different course and become, in, uh, and become indifferent to his teaching. Obeyed the gospel. Why is the people who have become Christians turned back to a life of sin? Once having obeyed the gospel, why is it? How does it happen? So you're telling me. Can I go answer my question? Yeah. So you're telling me this verse teaches once saved doesn't mean always saved? No, it doesn't. That's the, right, that's the reason the whole book was written. Because we're not once saved, always saved. We fall away because we stop giving strict attention to the words of Christ. We stop reading the words of Christ. We start studying the. We stop studying the words of Christ. We don't give the more earnest heed anymore. You know, when Christ was handing out bread, there was five thousand people, and he went to the garden, couldn't hardly find anybody. And then at the cross, there was just one person. You know what that tells me? The closer you live to the cross. Steve, Mike. Lest at any time Barnes says that no time should we be indifferent to those things. They're always important to us. We should never be in a state of mind when they would be uninteresting. At all times, in all places, in every situation of life, we should feel that the truths of religion are of more importance to, to us than all other truths and nothing should be suffered to efface their image from the heart. Is a nautical term. Lest at any time we should let them slip. For us and our flying redundant systems in an airplane to make sure that your heading isn't slipping. You, you, you can fly a heading and have a 20 knot crosswind and it's just, you have redundant systems to let you know that you're slipping. And you, can, you can fly the magenta if you want to, Russ. You know? 
But you really need to have a, a background of aviation and know about the winds and what all's going on around you. That's why we can't stick our head in the sands and, and, and pretend to be ignorant regarding how Satan operates. Because you start slipping, David. Just thinking too, just even one degree off, Stephen, you may go, you know, 179 degrees, but over a long period of time, you have absolutely, the, the angle just gets greater and greater over time. And you don't realize one degree makes that much of a difference. Yeah, it's not that big of a deal. You know, if you're, if you're one degree off back here, you continue on. Well, over here on this place, you're, you're far away. Way off. Way off course. You want to be able to see the airport where you're going. Because we, we slip. It's an interesting, it's an interesting terminology that the writer uses here. We're, we're bombarded. I have exposed in my notes. But the word exposed seemed to use to be alright to use, but the word bombarded is better. We're bombarded in this information age with, you know, currents of opinion and currents of habit and currents of action which tend to carry us away from the position that we ought to maintain. I don't know how they do it. I, I, I enjoy watching the barges go up and down the Mississippi River. Uh, I've seen the ones that go with the current and it doesn't look like they're making much progress, you know? And I ask myself, how can that be a cost-effective way to transport goods? It looks like it takes forever, even with the current. You got all the staff, got the big boats, all that stuff costs money. Tugs, whatever they're called. Got to pay all those people. And they're just inching, just inch by inch, up and down the river. But what I really don't understand, what's really even more difficult, is when they go against the against the current. That big, huge, um, what are those things called? What are those barges? Excuse me. Yeah, big, huge barges on the front, sometimes three and four wide. You know, I don't know, six, seven deep. Some of the larger ones. You got that tug back there, just. Competing against wind, competing against current, competing against <coughs> hydrostatic pressure and friction on the front of it. I don't understand all that stuff. I don't have a degree in all that. But certainly to go upstream, there's a lot of competition. It takes zero effort for a fish to go along with the current. You can, you can hit a fish on the head and throw it in the river. And it's going to go with the current. Is that what we're called to? Is that what we're called to do? Just go along and do what everybody else is doing. Just get in as best we can. Don't stand out too much. Men turn away from God's directions overnight. Just three seconds of decisions made. I think I'm gonna fall away. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm. I just don't think I'm gonna go back. Is that how it happens? You know how many people in their golden years of their life got a little sickness, stayed home a couple of weeks, and never came back, even though they were well enough to return? Isn't that terrible? In 50 years of your life, at every single service of the Lord's church, faithful and active, you get a little sickness. See, preachers do the same thing. A little bit different, kind of the same. It's been 50, 60, 65 years preaching. They get older, I don't guess they get tired of fighting. They get tired of preaching, so they get tired of, you know, wrangling. They get tired of contending for the faith. They change, just change what they, just change what they believe and what they teach. Think about some preachers that wrote books, and the books that they wrote convicted them, like, you know,
know, what's hell like? And then 20 years later, Jimmy Allen doesn't even believe in hell anymore. You know, Rubel Shelley, The Threats of Liberalism, or whatever book he wrote about liberalism when he was younger, and then he was the leader of liberalism 25 years later. Their books indicted him. That's the word I was looking for. They wrote books when they were younger, and then they changed what they believed. I'm saying they quit going to church per se, but they fell away. They fell away. I hear you. This is one of many, one of many verses that teach us that we can be faithful to God for a time. We also can be unfaithful to God for a time. And I think that the writer here says, lest at any time we should let them slip, that word them is in italics. It's not only the words, but it's also the man that spoke the words. That we, we should not let him slip. And we keep at the forefront of our minds all that Christ did for us. To say that you're going to live your life and never become unfaithful, well, good luck with that. Some of us haven't been so fortunate. To say that you could go 50, 60 years as a Christian and never fall away, I'm glad that people like you exist in the church. There's not many. There's not many. The rest of us have struggled. The rest of us have been unfaithful. The rest of us have allowed the Lord to take second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, twelfth, fifteenth, thirtieth place in our lives. And you know what it was that rearranged our priorities and brought us back home? It was Him. Him. When my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to thee, Garden of Gethsemane. It's a pretty word, isn't it? But for the majority of us, 99% of us, we have lived those words, haven't we? We've had some times of weakness and uncertainty, and we've had some times of unfaithfulness in our lives. And, you know, thankfully God doesn't require us to go run a marathon in New York City in order to be restored. Some people act, you know, some people, you know, act that way, that there's this do you know what's harder sometimes for us than running that marathon? Repentance. It's hard, isn't it? Repentance is hard. It's difficult. And it requires discipline. It requires intentionality. It requires faith to say, you know what, I, I, need, to, I need to offload. I need to offload this and get it out of my life. causing me to slip. We're getting distracted or us. Got all those fancy avionics and buttons and bells and whistles and switches and you know, all that stuff that distracts us. Uh, I see it even with our own kids already. You know, we are talking with them way up here. You're holding them or whatever, your phone's laying by the table and you're holding them, they see that phone. You know, we really don't let them watch the you know, phones and all that at this age. But they see it. They see the light and all that. They, they forget who's holding them. They forget about it. That's all they're worried about. They want to grab that phone. Eight months old. We're the same way. We're the same way. Well, if the word, for if, the word spoken by angels was steadfast. And so here we're going to lay out a, a, a syllogism. 
you know, if this is true, then this is true. And in the argument here, a very logically arranged argument, it begins with the supposition that every sin, that every transgression and disobedience, that it merits a fair, a just, an equal recompense, or payback, or reward from God. Does that make sense? Is that true? Is it true that every transgression and disobedience receives a just payback from God? Is that true? Every transgression must receive recompense. Who paid it for us? Every transgression must receive a just recompense of a reward of payback. In the Christian's case, Christ paid it for him. But this statement, at the very heart of it, Without qualification is true, right? Is it true? You only need a passing knowledge of the Old Testament to know that this is true. Made Adam and the sons of Aaron took either them and sent to put fire their own incense, their own fire their own incense, the fire their in incense, their own, offered a strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not, and lo, fire came from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. How? Every transgression and disobedience received just recompense of reward. That's true.
What can we see with our eyes? Jury duty, our judicial system, our legal system. And we see it where even people that, there's, there's no doubt sometimes with regard to crimes that are committed, there's no doubt who committed the crime, but they still receive due process. A stand before a judge and plead not guilty and have preliminary hearings, waive the right to you know, waive the right to put a hearing or have one or bound over to the grand jury. They go to the grand jury, they either set up with the DA's office or they have a, a jury trial. They drag this thing out for years. For years. There was a road for me back in 2011 when I was living in the Murray City. The cats that killed her just had a trial like six months ago. We 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 moved 14 times since then. I mean, not really, but there's you know how much stuff has happened in our lives since that woman was killed. Her brothers and sisters, she don't have much family left. It's been that long. And so we see that, and even we can see. Sometimes the injustices, right? We see, you know, in, just in Nashville, we saw somebody, you know, throw, you know, throw liquid on some people, and you know, uh, try to resist officers, you know, trying to uh, uh, disrupt a gathering, you know, at Marshall Blackburn's rally, we're trying to disrupt that, and they get taken out, fighting against the officers, and then out on bond, and then he throws coffee or something on some lawmakers, and then he goes to court. It's just dismissed. If I had done that, it would be dismissed. We see some of the some of the injustice. We see some of those things take place. You see what happened in Chicago this past week? I did. It wouldn't happen to us. And so we see where it's like some live under a legal system, and then some of us live under a judicial system. Like there's two different systems. And we can begin, if we're not careful, to think that God operates the same way. It depends on who you are, what you are, what you're about, and then some, oh yeah, yeah you know, some, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to drag it out and kind of let the public forget about it a little bit, and then maybe he qualifies for a diversion and we'll, shh, shh, shh. David's song, David said, God tells you David said, you do not be afraid what he In a precatory song, God said, hey, your enemies are my enemies. Mm. <laughs> well, that's what we're familiar with. Kind of the plus, minus, on again, off again, depends on who the judge is, depends on the area, depends on who you are. But make no mistake about it. God does not operate that way. Does not. Red, yellow, black, or white. Rich, poor. Doesn't matter the sin. Big sin, little sin. White lie. First degree murder. Oklahoma City bombing. 9 11. It doesn't matter how large scale. Every transgression and disobedience will receive a just recompense of reward. Either you're going to pay or you're going to allow Christ to pay for you. We can't forget that. And then based upon that, based upon that truth, he tells them, you are not going to be able to escape if you neglect so great a salvation. That's why we're here this morning. Part of the reason why is because we know God's offered a way of escape. And if we don't take it, there is no. This is it. This, the church is the escape. The blood is the escape. So we're here this morning. And we'll be here this afternoon. We'll be here Wednesday night. We'll be here next Sunday. For years and years and years and years, we are going to give the more earnest heed because every transgression and disobedience will receive a just recompense or reward. 
we will not escape if we neglect this salvation. There will not be another opportunity. There will not be another Savior. There will not be another way. There will not be another church. This is it. We're living in it, folks. We're living in it. Any questions? Thank <laughs> you. 
also a good group. Thank you. 
him uh, in our prayers and, and them as we might be able to do for them. Also, a friend of Sue, uh, Donnie, Donnie Bell, is sick today, and, and her son Chris Solomon uh, came through his surgery well and, and will have to be in bed for six weeks and then have a, another surgery. And, He'll be moved to the waters possibly tomorrow. So continue to remember him. Also, a thank you card from uh, Sue and Harry that will be uh, placed on the bulletin board and, and in the bulletin. Um, Wednesday morning Bible class will resume uh, Wednesday, April the 3rd. So remember that we will be here at 9.30 for uh, some uh, coffee and donuts and biscuits and gravy and then a lesson at 10 o'clock. Uh, BBS teachers and volunteers remember that after the 1 p.m. service today, as soon as that is over, you need to meet because beginning work, this is a meeting for uh, planning and uh, getting the uh, efforts underway to make BBS uh, uh, function smoothly and uh, be even a better uh, activity and training for all that will attend than even last year. The regular program teachers meeting and workshop will be next Saturday morning. Keep that in mind. Saturday from 9 until 11 a.m. And at 8.45, if you would like to get here at that time, there will be uh, some donuts and juice uh, before starting. Keeping in mind today is the fifth Sunday, and as usual, it will be there will be a potluck meal following uh, service this morning, and then at 1 p.m. we will uh, assemble for the evening lesson, and uh, then we will not meet at five. As always, we remind the one who will have the closing prayer, please also include in that your, uh, the thanks for, to offer thanks for the food that we will partake of in the fellowship meeting. These are the announcements I have at this time. Anything that you need to get to me, get that to me between now and one, and we will take care of this one. Now, enter into our worship service.
come before thee at this time, thanking thee for another beautiful Lord's Day that you've given us, another day that we can rise from our beds and to be able to come and to study a portion of thy word this first day of the week, to sing songs of praise to thy holy name, and to come to thee and call thee Father in the Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the <coughs> blessings that you continue to see to our needs. And Father, we pray that you will continue to do so. Father, we're much grateful for our families, our friends, our shelters, all the conveniences that we have in this world that we call America, the freedoms that we have. Father, we pray that you will be with the leaders of our country. That they may put thee first in their lives. Look to thee for guidance. That we can once again be that country that we can call one nation under God. Father, we pray that you will be with our families. We're thankful for the institution of the family. And Father, we pray for the dads and the moms that have the children. Father, we pray that they will have the wisdom to look for thee when they need instruction on how to raise their children. Father, we're thankful for our children that they are continually a blessing to us. We're thankful for our grandchildren. And Father, those of here that also have great-grandchildren, we're, we're so blessed. Our Heavenly Father, we have some sick that we need to mention. They are part of our family here at Bishop Street at this time. And we know that by studying that word that sometimes if we ask the best that you will not hear. You will not do is what we ask you to do. So Father, at this time we're mindful of <coughs> Freddie Sherpas and Greta Ragsdale. Father, we pray that you will be with Sandra as she takes care of brother for the trying times that they have and seem to continue to have. For Mindy, and Father, we're thankful for her being with us today. And Father, we pray that you will continue to bless her and the, with the doctors and the nurses as, as they see to her. Father, we pray that you will be with Scott and the children. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're mindful of those that are suffering due to the illnesses that come on our lives from time to time. Beside his Morpheus' daughter, we pray that you will give her a peace of fire in which to depart. Be with him beside him. And may she look to thee for guidance and strength. And Father, these that we have mentioned, we pray that, that we as part of this family here that see to them, that can make their lives a little bit more comfortable by the things that we do for them, the things that we say to them, and the encouragement that we can give them. Because, Heavenly Father, we realize that the devil is walking about like a roaring lion. And, Father, we do not want him to have any part of our family. Be with Brad, and we're thankful for him and his abilities to lead our singing. May we sing these songs by reading the words and applying them to our lives that we can edify one another and encourage one another to keep on living that faithful Christian life. Father, we pray that you will forgive us when we fail thee. 
Father, may we always have the strength and courage and willpower to look to thy word and apply it to our lives for need that we can truly be that people that you would have us to be. Father, we're thankful for thy son Jesus, that he was willing to leave that heavenly place and to come to this earth and to live in the form and fashion of a man. That he walked these earths some 33 years, that he set the divine example that we can look to thee. But Father, he went to the cross to shed his blood, that without his shedding of his blood, we know that we would not have an ability or chance to go to heaven with and spend eternity with thee. Be with us now as we go through the rest of this worship service. Heavenly Father, in we pray that if there's anything that is amiss in our lives at this time, we pray that you would forgive us. And Father, when it's time for us to leave this a walk of life, we pray that we can hear that those words of comfort. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. This is our prayer in Christ's name.
We pray that as we take this cup that we can do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. That we can examine ourselves as we take this. Christ, let me pray. Amen.
morning, if you have your Bibles, if you can open up to Acts chapter 4, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Oh, a good way you read that scripture. You might just stay up here and finish preaching that sermon up for us, David. We're glad that you're here today. Today's a great day. I know it's the Lord's Day. Time for us to gather together to study and read and to pray. Remember the Lord's death. Continue uh, giving to the Lord's church and His cause. The meal that's prepared, we're glad that you're going to stay for that. Enjoy that with us. We're glad that Lenny Sue's with us. Mindy and Scott Corsi. We uh, unfortunately don't always pronounce their last name right here in this place. Uh, but we still love them. And uh, they have been constantly uh, in our prayers. And uh, we're glad you all are with us uh, this morning. In Acts chapter 4, when they had sent them in the midst, they said, hey, by what power, by what name, have you done this? Verse number 8, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said that you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means he's made whole? Be it known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Let this stone which was set at all of you builders which has become head of the corner, neither is there salvation any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When we leave here today, will anyone say of you that you had been with Jesus? I've asked sometimes the folks at the desk at the hotel, what are the worst groups? Sports teams? I say church groups. I've asked folks at the restaurant, hey, What's your favorite day of the week? Not Sunday. I have to do Sunday lunch. Sometimes those people are so rude to us. When we leave this place, will anybody be able to say that we have been with Jesus? The Bible says that the people saw the boldness and the courage of Peter and John, and they took note that they, it had been almost two months since the crucifixion of Jesus. Two months since God's dear Son had been executed by the Roman soldiers. In the eyes of many, Jesus was just a momentary blip on the screen, just a momentary blip on the radar, just another religious fanatic who had come and gone. Pilate washed his hands of him. The Pharisees, they were glad to get rid of him. The people no longer cared because he was not the militant political messiah that they had hoped for. They had rejected him. Yet when Peter and John came to town, it didn't take long for the people to realize that they had been with Jesus. When you got around these men, you could smell the aroma of Jesus. You could feel the radiance of Jesus. I wonder what are those characteristics? What does that person look like? When they saw that they had been with Jesus, what is it that they saw? I think first of all, they saw compassion. Early in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they had healed a man that had been lame for 40 years. 40 years. I'm not even 40 years old. Close. Almost there. But I cannot imagine having been lame for my whole life. Glad Brendan Scherf is with us this morning. Freddie's at home with gout. I have had an experience for three or seven with gout. And uh, people say, why, you know, why are you limping? <laughs> well, you don't have to ask. 
You know, that's what it is. I, it's not fun. In fact, I call it gouch because it hurts. But we're still able to get up and move around, uh, move about in some degree. I've never been completely debilitated by it. Some people are. But I can't imagine being lame for 40 years. And in Acts chapter 3, they had compassion and they took the time to show this man some compassion. You can't help but be been with Jesus. Because Jesus was a man of compassion. Sure, was told of an orphanage had a director that would always pray with the children. He would ask the blessing. He'd bow his head with all the little children. He'd say, Lord Jesus, we thank you for the food you provided. Won't you come and be our honored guest today at this meal? The little boy heard that prayer many times. He said, Why doesn't Jesus ever come? You always invite him to be our guest. Will he come? Will he ever come and have a meal with us? The little fellow said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a chair out here for him. That way, if he comes, he'll have a place to sit down. Well, at the evening meal, there was a knock at the door. They went to the door. There was an older man in rags. <coughs> older man in rags. He was hungry. He was shivering. He was cold. And the superintendent said, Hey, you know, come in and share our meal with us. We'd be glad to have you. Just come and sit down here and warm yourself. We have, we have a chair for you. Sit right here and... He put the man in the chair that had been set aside for Jesus. After that was over with, the little fellow looked up. He said, I can see it all so clearly. Jesus couldn't come himself, so he sent this man to take his place. If you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. When we show compassion to others, then we directly show compassion to our Lord. A true mark of a person that's been with Jesus is a person that shows compassion, but when they saw that they had been with Jesus, I wonder if there's anything else that they saw. Certainly, I think courage would have to be. Listen, you see, back in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, they had been arrested, and the crimes that they had been arrested for was preaching the gospel. We're not using anything like that already. I mean, could you imagine we're preaching this morning and, you know, next thing a little SWAT team surrounds the building and they come in and they arrest me for preaching the gospel this morning to you all. Can you imagine that? We're not used to anything like that. It's so far and from our minds, it's, it's hard for us to process. The priest, the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees came up to Peter and John. While they were speaking to the people, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They seized Peter and John because it was evening and put them in jail for the next day. These guys were arrested for preaching that Jesus was risen from the dead. Process that for a minute. The scripture says that to the Jews, the cross was a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it was foolishness, but it didn't stop Peter and John from preaching. They had the courage to speak the truth even though they were surrounded by opposition. Is courage a trait that defines us today? The week before September the 11th, back in 2001, Todd Beamer and his wife Lisa, they had spent a week in Italy. They returned home, rested, relieved to be reunited with their kids. David, who was three at the time, Andrew, who was one. The next morning, Todd had to be at a sales rep meeting in Northern California. He kissed his wife, Lisa, who was with child, five months along with their third child. Headed to Newark, New Jersey airport, reported United Flight number 93 from San Francisco. In about 90 minutes into the westbound flight, the Boeing 757 was approaching Cleveland with three hijackers on board, identified themselves with 34 passengers, seven crew, proceeded to take control of the cockpit of the cabin. The plane now piled by the terrorists made a sharp turn to the south. You remember that Todd was the one that made a call on the phone on the back of the seats. He told the supervisor on the ground what was going on. He and the passengers probably wouldn't survive. He presumed that the pilot and the co-pilot were seriously injured. And the GTE employee told him what had already happened at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. And upon hearing this, Todd must have realized what was going on. 
He has other person on the phone to tell his wife and report their entire conversation to her, including how much he loved her. Todd was reported to be a committed Christian, a devoted family man, taught Sunday school each week. Sounds of pastor screaming in the background. And before they got off the line, he said, are you ready, guys? Let's roll. And with that, the phone went dead. Flight 93 was nosediving in a rural field about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh where it left the crater 40 feet deep as it disintegrated upon impact. I wonder who all was saved that day from terrorist detentions. I think about the other three businessmen who joined it, intended target our nation's capital. No telling how many lives were saved, and according to Todd's wife, Lisa, his example of courage has given me, my boys, my unborn child, a reason to live. So what does September 11, 2001 have to do with your sermon today? Well, <laughs> Satan is hijacking lives as we speak and crashing them into the ground. God's people have to find within us someplace, somewhere, the same courage that Todd, Beaver, and the others have. We've got to take back the flame and rescue it before it is too late. And it will only be done by people that have the courage to match their convictions. But where can we get the courage to lead people out of darkness and show them to the light? Verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they were uneducated, untrained men. They marveled and realized they had been with Jesus. They possessed the strength and the courage to match their convictions because they had spent time Charles Spurgeon said, There's something in the very tone of the man who has been with Jesus, which has more power to touch the heart than the most perfect oracle. If you desire the courage to tell people about salvation, you've got to spend more time with Jesus. If you desire to have the boldness to tell us of the cross, you've got to spend more time with Jesus. But what else did they see? They saw someone who was committed. You know, Peter and John... They were locked, stock, and barrel, sold out to Jesus Christ. They were committed to the person of Jesus. No one, not a family member, not a friend, no thing, no life, no limb meant more to them than Jesus Christ and their following Him. They were committed to the preaching of Jesus. You know, if, if a law was passed today that made it a crime to talk about Jesus... How many of us would be arrested this coming week? I wonder if, if some Christians that are living in America today, if they would feel kind of relieved because they feel guilty for not talking about him more. Then they could say, well, I mean, I don't do it because it's illegal. I don't break any laws or anything. And it would give us an excuse for our silence. How many of us would go to jail next week the law was passed today, we could no longer talk about Jesus. Now, if they made it a crime to talk about March Madness, now a couple of us this past week, we'd have hundreds of charges. We lack sometimes the commitment and the courage to talk about the one that saved us. You know, if these disciples had just obeyed the law, their lives would have been so much easier. Nobody would have been upset with them. They wouldn't have been under danger or threats of being imprisoned or being put in jail, persecution. They could have a, a nice, quiet life. They could uh, die as respected and well-liked. He'd just give you the shirt off his back. At a ripe old age, they would have died. We don't have to worry about persecution. So why don't we talk about Jesus? Why don't we talk about the church? Because we're afraid of what somebody would say about us. You think Peter and John was worried about that? They didn't care if somebody said something against them. They didn't care if they had put in prison on their resume. They didn't 
didn't care what other people thought about them. If we've truly met the risen Christ, and if we've ever really been with Him, then we'll have to say the same thing that the disciples said. They said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Y'all don't understand. We can't keep it in. Some other people have said to me before, Steve, if you ever lose your voice, you probably just explode. They said, we got to get it out. We got to get you stored up for. We can't keep it in. We can't help but to speak the things which we have seen and heard. They were not only committed to preaching about Jesus, but they were also committed to pleasing. They, they didn't care about pleasing man, they cared about pleasing God. In chapter 5, we have a rerun of the same thing that takes place in chapter 4. Peter and John are thrown in prison for a second time for preaching Jesus. They're brought before this same council, and notice what they said. Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? You ever been in that position before? You ever had a ball stain and do something that wasn't right, that wasn't ethical? Don't do that. You did it anyway? You ever been there? I have. I have. Several years ago, I had a boss tell us that we had a patient that was on a ventilator. We could just show up with a BBM and transport them to the hospital. To Jackson or to Nashville or to Memphis. We could just bag them. I'm not bagging them. I mean... I'm not going to be a part of that. There are plenty of studies in hospitals. Seventy percent of those patients have severe complications, including cardiac arrest and death. That's just in the hospital. We're not talking about going 80 miles an hour down the road. I'm not going to be bagging patients. He said, I wouldn't be afraid to bag my daughter. I said, I would. Be very afraid. Not the right thing to do. That's why they have transport ventilators. That's why people are trained with ventilators. That's why they have respiratory therapists. Because it's not safe to transport patients with a BBM. Didn't we tell you that it was okay? That you would be in trouble if you refused to transport a patient with a BBM? I might be in trouble, but I wasn't wrong. That's what they told Peter and James. Didn't we tell you not to do this anymore? Didn't we tell you all that? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said these famous words. We all. There's that word again we used in Bible class this morning. We all obey God rather than men. Acts 5, 28 and 49. You see, when a man has been with Jesus, all that matters is that he obey God. Do you know who Truett Cathy is? Does that name sound familiar to you? Truett S. Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A restaurant. W would you say that Truett is a successful businessman? Not with us anymore. I would say that I would say that he is. But he's even better known and respected for letting his faith guide his decisions and his business operation. You see, his restaurants, they've been closed on Sunday since the beginning in 1948. This man doesn't mind losing millions of dollars in business every Sunday to honor the Lord's Day. And many people, they would like to see, if you took a poll of the people that that are the kind of frequent shoppers at Chick-fil-A and the people in the community said, would you like for Chick-fil-A to be open on Sunday? If you took a poll of their best customers, the customers would say, yes, we would love for them. We love their chicken. We would be great to get a chicken and biscuit on the way to church. Everybody else says, open up on Sunday. But the CEO said, no, we're not, no, not going to do that. In fact, a couple of months ago in South Haven, Mississippi, the McDonald's in South Haven threw some shade at Chick-fil-A and put on their sign, we sell chicken and biscuits even on Sunday.
Sure, Kathy said, you know what? Public opinion doesn't drive my decision. God does. God does. We should be so close to Jesus that we always strive to please Him and not man. These disciples, they were uneducated. These disciples were untrained. They did not have a lot of influence. They did not have a lot of power. They did not have a lot of intellectual brilliance. But they were mighty servants of God. And they were written down in the book of Acts chapter 4 for our reading this morning. And the reason why they were written down is because they had been with Jesus. Is it in our prayer that our relationship should be so close with our Lord that when others see us, they can say, you know what? There's something about him. You know, there's something about her. Because we have been with Jesus. <laughs> There's a lot of things that the cross offers us this morning. A lot of people ridicule it. A lot of people mock it. Make fun of it. But there's the one thing that we cannot do when it comes to the power of the cross, and that's ignore it. We can't help but leave here and be somewhat changed and be somewhat different. Because we have been Jesus. And while you're with it, why don't you follow him down in the baptistry? <coughs> Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Come up out of the water rejoicing, excited, happy, different, transformed, new, added to the Lord's church, forgiven, cleansed, washed, made new. let those things that we've heard maybe in our own lives we like those Hebrew Christians we have let him slip let us give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard so that in our lives those who see us can say no we see
to our Timothy uh, young man here in a minute. Since we're not meeting this afternoon, I'd like to meet with him for about 15 or 20 minutes over in uh, in our room. I think we're going to have an abbreviated class this afternoon. I think what we can do is get everything we need to get done in about 15 or 20 minutes. So as soon as amen is said, y'all, just go right over there. No goofing around. Just, just go get your songbook and go into our room.